Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different types of immunological tools, what you can use. So in our previous lectures, we have discussed about how you can be able to generate the uh, polyclonal as well as the monoclonal antibodies and then subsequent to that, we were discussing about how the antibodies are interacting with the antigen and how that interaction can be exploited to design different types of immunological tools to, uh, to uh, answer the different types of biological problems. So following that discussions, today we are going to discuss few more analytic, few more immunological tools where the antibody and antigen ant are interacting with each other. So this is what we were discussing so far that the antigen, if it is insoluble in nature, you can actually be able to perform the agglutinations or if it is soluble in nature, you can be able to perform the precipitation as well as the radio immunoassay as well as the immunoprecipitations. So in the today's lecture, we and, and subsequent to that, we have also planning to discuss about the different types of immunoassay which are also being based on the antibody antigen interactions such as ELISA, RIA and the western blotting. So subsequent to the uh, radio immunoassay, we are now going to discuss about the immunoprecipitations. So immunoprecipitation, the basic principle is very simple. The principle is that where you are going to take the empty beads and these empty beads are actually going to have the functional groups. So with the help of these functional group, what you are going to do is you are going to attach the uh, the particular antibodies. These antibodies are actually going to be specific for a particular antigen and then what, so this beads is going to be prepared, okay. In a, uh, on a parallel, what you are going to do is you are going to break the cell and you are going to prepare a cell lysates and in this cell lysate, you are going to have the different types of proteins uh, which I am showing you with the different types of beads or different types of color beads. So these are all the pot potential antigens which actually can interact with this antibody and actually can give you the, uh, which actually can be isolated from these particular uh, cell line, uh, cell lysate. So in the third step, what you are going to do is you are going to incubate this bead bound uh, antibody with the cell lysate which actually contains different types of antibody, uh, different types of antigens and then uh, when you do the incubations, the one of some of these uh, proteinaceous factors or antigens are going to bind the antibody, and then you are going to do a initial washing step, and then you are going to do the identification of this particular antigen with the help of several techniques, such as you can run it on the SDS page, or you can do it like the silver staining, or you can do the uh, western blotting with the additional uh, antibodies. How to perform this assay? Uh, so to perform this assay, the, these are the following material what you require. First you require a lysis buffer. This lysis buffer is required for preparing a cell lysate. So it has all the components like the buffer, then NaCl and then it has the detergent and then it also has the protease inhibitor. So this is a protease inhibitor which you have to add just before reconstituting the lysis buffer. So protease inhibitor is actually going to protect the cell lysate from the degradation by the proteases which is going to be present in the cell lysate. Apart from that, you also require a washing buffer. So washing buffer is exactly this, this composition like the buffer, then you require EDTA, NACL and NP40 and then you also require a small centrifuge so that you can be able to do the pelleting and all that. In the first step, you are going to prepare the cell lysate. So you wash the uh, 10 to power 6 cells with a phosphate buffer saline and then you add 1 ml of ice cold lysate buffer in the cell pellet. Similarly, you can approximately 50 mg tissue lysate can also be prepared. So either you are going to have the individual cells or you are going to have the tissue, uh, either is respective of the case you have to break open the tissue to release the individual cells and then you can actually be able to add the uh, lysis buffer or if you have the individual cells, you can actually treat it with the lysis buffer and that actually is going to give you the uh, 
uh, the cell lysate. Then you centrifuge this uh, mixture at uh, uh, for, for a full speed like the 15,000 G and uh, that actually is going to give you the clear cell lysate which means it is actually going to remove all the debris from the cell lysate. Then the step 2 you are going to do the incubation with the antibody to the supernatant keep adding a, a specific antibody. So, this specific antibody means the antibody which is against a particular antigen uh, at a appropriate concentration. So, that depends on the amount of antigen present. As you recall in a previous lecture itself where we discussed that the antigen antibody precipitation reaction is a stoichiometry uh, governed which means if you require a proper pre precipitations the amount of antigen as well as the amount of antibody has to be in a equimolar ratios. So, if you add li little antibodies uh, or a very high amount of antibodies, the precipitation is not going to be adequate. You add that for, for 1 hour at 4 degree with uh, shocking, uh, this 1 hour can be overnight also in some cases when the antigen is very difficult to bind or uh, you require the more number of recovery. Uh, then you add the 0.9 ml of uh, protein A saffrose. So, protein A saffrose is the bead. Uh, which actually is going to bind the antibodies and then shake for another 30 minutes at 4 degree. You wash the saffrose mixture thrice in washing buffer containing 900 millimolar NaCl. So, this is the high salt concentration which you are going to use so that you will remove the non-specifically bound protein to the antibodies as well as to the beads uh, to remove the non-specific binding. Finally, wash the mixture once in a washing buffer. So, now once you are uh, once you are done with the washing with the lysis buffer as well as washing with the washing buffer, uh, your sample is now ready and now what you can do is you can elute the, uh, the, the antigens from the antibodies and then you can be able to analyze them. So, in the subsequent step, in the step 3 you are going to do the analysis of sample on the SDS page. So, you remove the supernatant after the centrifugation at high speed. Uh, to the protein A saffrose slurry beads, add 800 microliter of 1x SDS gel loading buffer and boil it for 4 minutes. Load the sample into the large well of the discontinuous SDS page gradient gel and the run the gel at a constant temperature of 10 milliamps. So, once you have the beads which actually have the antibodies and antibodies are binding to the particular antigen from the cell lysate, you take those beads, wash it, remove the supernatant and then you add the 1x uh, SDS loading buffer and then you heat it and boil it. So, in that process all the antigenic uh, determinants because the antibody is going to be denatured when you do so and the antibody is going to release the antigen into the supernatant and that supernatant you can load it onto the SDS page. In this case uh, we are using the gradient SDS page so that the resolution is going to be even better and then you uh, run it for at constant current for 10 milliamps because we want to we do we want to uh, we do not want to create the heat into the system so that there will be a denaturation of the antigen. So, that is why you have to run it at a 10 milliamps uh, current at a very very slow rate so that it is actually going to resolve the samples, but it will not going to heat the gels. Then you are going to for the step 4 you can visualize the proteins with the help of either the Comasi blue, brilliant blue staining or the more st uh, sensitive silver staining. At this stage you, what you can also do is you can take the SDS gel and you can actually can do the western blotting with a specific antibody. For example, if I am expecting a actin to be present bound to the antibodies, what I can do is I can just take this supernatant, load it onto the SDS page, I can do a staining with the Comasi or silver staining to check that I am getting a band very close to these uh, to the level of the actin. But alternatively what I can do is I can just simply transfer that gel onto a nitrocellulose membrane and then I can do a western blotting with the anti-actin antibodies. And that actually is going to give me the specific information about the protein what is present into the SDS page whether it is a actin protein or some other proteins. The results, the 
Interacting protein will give an extra band in the SDS gel and can be further characterized by probing a protein on the SDS page with another antibody in a western blot. So this is a typical result what you see. So in the lane 1 we have loaded the molecular markers, lane 1 is actually a only antibodies, lane 2 is actually the beats plus lysate and the lane 3 is actually the complete reaction. So what you can see is the lane, is, lane 1 is showing some band because some of the protein will bind to the antibodies. The lane 2 is showing more number of band and those are the non-specific band which are actually binding to the antibody as well as binding to the beats. So these two are actually going to be, these two uh, the protein which are binding to the beads as well as the protein which are binding to only antibodies are has to be uh, uh, subtracted and then you can actually be uh, analyze uh, the sample which is actually in the number 3 where the antibody as well as the bead plus lysate is present. And in this what you see is there are specific bands which are appearing into this and now what you can do is you can also do a western blotting of this sample with the specific anti antibodies or anti antigen antibodies so whichever the antigen you are expecting that that should present in this particular uh, immunoprecipitations or in some cases if you are not uh, sure then you can go through with the molecular weight and then you can probably can uh, make a you know intelligent guessing and then actually be able to probe the sds page with the particular antibody and to recognize or to identify this particular protein in a generic approach if you don't know any of these things or you don't know even the pathway then what you are supposed to do is you have to take out that particular uh, protein from the gel you have to do a trypsinization so that it should produce the peptides and then you can send this peptide for the mass spectrometry and then you can do the uh, the proteomics studies and then actually that 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 also will allow you to identify this particular protein now uh, apart from the amino precipitation where you are actually using the antibody as a probe so that it will bind to the beads and then you can use that bind, uh, bead bound uh, antibodies for getting the proteins from the cell lysate or getting the antigen from the cell lysate. Many people are also using or, uh, or also uh, performing a slightly derived version of this uh, which is called as the pull down assays. So in the pull down assays you are either using the antibodies or you are also using the some other protein which is bind to the beats. So let us discuss about the pull down assay which is actually a, a modification of the immunoprecipitation assays. So in a pull down assay what people are doing is they are taking a GST beats and the GST beats has the functional group. So that GST group uh, functional group uh, is present and on that functional group so they are preparing the two beads. One is the control bead where you have the GST beads with the functional group. The other one is the uh, the probe bead or probe bead so where you are actually having the GST beads and on this functional group you have the probe this probe is also called as the bait protein so that bait protein is the specific protein on which uh, for to against which you are interested to see how many proteins are interacting and then what you do is you prep you take the cell you Break, break open with the lysis buffer to generate the cell lysate and this cell lysate actually contains the different types of antigens and then what you do is uh, divide this cell lysate into two reactions okay and then you incubate these with the these two preparation of the beads and then these two beads are actually going to bind the non-specific protein for example in this case it has bound this particular protein so this and whereas in this case it has bound the yellow color protein as well as the uh, this uh, uh, pink color protein. So now what you do is you do a washing and then you do the identification of the protein with the help of the uh, different types of analytical uh, dyes available or different types of uh, western blotting experiments. So how to perform the pull down assay? Uh, so in the materials uh, what you require is the lysis buffer. So lysis buffer has the buffer, NACL, EDTA and then you have the NP40 and then just before the use you can add the 1, mil, 1 millimolar PMSF. So PMSF is also a protease inhibitor which actually going to protect the sample from the uh, degradation by the proteases. 
then you require the GST fusion protein carrying the bait or the GST protein. So, these are the control protein, these are the uh, probe proteins and then you require the SDS space sample lying buffer or then you require the glutathione agarose beads and then you require the boiling water bath as well as the micro centrifuge. In the step 1, you are going to do the pre-clean the lysate. So, initially you, you, will, you will prepare the lysate by, by uh, baking open the cell with the help of the lysate buffer and then you are going to do a pre-clean. Uh, in the pre-clean, what you are going to do is you are going to take the lysate and then you are going to add the 50 microliter of a glutathione agarose bead in a lysis buffer and 25 microgram of GST at 2 hours. So, that actually is going to remove the proteins which are interacting with the GST beads or with the GST alone. Okay? And that actually is going to be a pre-clean step which means it is actually going to reduce the background of the proteins what is present in your reactions. Then what you do is you centrifuge the content for 10 minutes and then you transfer the supernatant to a fresh tube then you are going to set up the reactions. So, divide the cleaned, uh, cleaned lysate into two tubes equally and add 50 microliter of glutathione agarose bleeds to the two tubes. To one tube, you add approximately 10 microgram of GST protein and to the other tube, you add approximately 10 microgram of GST fusion protein. The amount of probe protein and the amount of the GST protein has to be equal which means equal means in terms of the equimolar ratios. So, if you have the GST of 1 molecular weight and the bait is of 1 molecular weight, this means if you if I am adding the 10 microgram of GST, uh, uh, so then and if the GST and the bait is present in the 1 is to 1 ratio, then why what I have to do is I have to add the 5 microgram of GST bait uh, protein because that actually is going to make these two uh, beads in a equimolar ratio. So, you have to add the control beads which actually contains the GST uh, bound to it as well as the probe beads in a equimolar ratio which means you have to calculate the molecular weight of the bait protein and add it into the GST and then only you can be able to calculate the molar ratios of both the GST as well as the GST bait complexes. Uh, so, the amount of probe which means the GST fusion protein and the control protein added should be in equimolar ratio. Incubate the tube for 1 hour at 4 degree with mixing. Then in step 3, you centrifuge the sample at the maximum speed and in a micro switch, which means like 15,000 G. Then you go to the uh, step 4 and step 4 is a washing step and remember that whatever you are doing whether you are doing the immunoprecipitation or to the uh, pull down assays you always have to keep the supernatants you have to keep saving the supernatant so that if there will be no protein pr present after the final step you can be able to cross verify at what step you have done something wrong so that the protein complexes are bound to the beads but they have been detached so that you can actually vary or you can be able to optimize the buffer condition so that the it actually allows the protein complexes to come and bind to the beads because that is very important to uh, monitor. So, that is why I, at every stage when you are doing the spinning and throwing the supernatant, instead of throwing the supernatant, you preserve that supernatant into a additional append of tube so that you can be able to uh, cross verify if there anything goes wrong with the experiments. So, in the step 4, you are going to do a washing. So, wash the beads with 1 ml of ice cold GST lysis buffer twice using a centrifuge at the top speed for 1 minute and then you discard the supernatant. Although I am writing discard the supernatant, but as I said you know you have to preserve this supernatant for cross verification if anything goes wrong. Then the step 5 you are going to do elution. So, elute the GST fusion protein and any protein bound to it by adding the 50 microliter of 20 millimolar reduced glutathione in 50 millimolar trace HCl to the beads centrifuge the beads for 2 minutes in a micro centrifuge and then you prepare the sample. So, mix the beads or the eluted protein with an equal amount of 2x SDS buffer and boil it for 1 minute and analyze onto the SDS page. 
In the step 7, you are going to do the analysis on the SDS page. The protein associated with the fusion protein could be analyzed by using the Comasi or the silver staining by immunoblotting for a specific protein analysis and can, can also be analyzed using the mass spectrometry. In a alternative of to, to this is that if you use the radioactivity or if you use the radioactivity labeled protein from the lysate, then you also can perform the arteriogram to check the uh, presence of a particular protein or you can just do arteriogram and that actually is going to give you the pattern of the proteins. Let us see how the results look like. So, in the results you are going to see an extra band on the Comasi or the specific band with the immunoblot showing the specificity of the protein. So, what you can see this is a one of the representative uh, images from the literature and what you see is that the, this is the marker then the number one is actually the GST probe which is actually the full, full reactions then the step two is the GST which is actually the GST alone and then the step three is actually the probe alone. So, what you can see is this is actually the band of the probe what is present in the reaction number one and this is the band of the GST and what you can see is that these two bands which are present in this uh, full reaction are actually be uh, specific proteins which are interacting with the, uh, the bait protein or the probe protein. So, these are the specific proteins uh, can be identified by multiple method either you can go with the proteomics approach which means you can just simply do the isolating this protein from the gel and then you do the trypsinization and downstream all the proteomics steps and then you ultimately can do the mass spectrometry and identify or you can actually do a western blotting with a specific antibody which actually you can say simply because if you know the molecular weight of this protein then you can say what will be the molecular weight of this particular protein and that is how you can be able to identify that particular protein. So, this is all about the pull down assays or the immunoprecipitation assays where you are using the antibody as or the, uh, the affinity columns for uh, recovering or to isolating a specific antigen from the cell lysate. Now, let us move on to the immunoassays. So, one of the immunoassay is the ELISA. So, ELISA is an immunological technique used to measure the level of antibodies or antigen in the body fluid. It has been used in diagnostics to identify the antigen or the cross reactive antibodies. ELISA can be performed in different way to either measure the antibody or the antigen. So, ELISA can be performed as a direct ELISA, indirect ELISA sandwich ELISA as well as the competitive ELISA and all these ELISAs are actually designed to either uh, uh, measure the level of antibodies or to the measure the level of antigen. So, let us discuss about each and every ELISA in detail. So, the direct ELISA, in a direct ELISA the target antigen is first coated onto a multi-well plate and then you are detecting that by an enzyme linked primary antibody which means you are going to take a, a well, you coat it with the antigen what you are interested to identify and then you are going to add the primary antibody which means you are going to add the antibody which is actually coupled to a enzyme and then what you can do is you just add the substrate and that substrate is going to give you the color or substrate is actually going to give you some readouts. It is simple and quick to perform due to the minimum steps required. So, that is the advantage of the direct ELISA, but the direct ELISA solely depends on the specificity of the primary antibodies, which means there is no control. So, that is why if there is a, a, any problem with the specificity of the primary antibody, it is actually going to give you the false positive results. That is why the specificity of the primary antibody may be affected by the enzyme linking the primary antibody and that is why it is very very uh, troublesome to perform because once you have the primary antibody you have to do a coupling reactions to that the enzyme is going to be coupled to the primary antibody and in that process sometime it actually affects the specificity of the antibody itself. The second thing is because it does not have the amplification step because if you, uh, so the signal is going to be 
as proportional to the amount of primary antibody bound to the antigen. So, if you have a monoclonal antibody for example, then it is actually going to interact only with the single epitope what is present onto a particular antigen and in that case the signal is going to be less uh, very low compared to if you are using a polyclonal antibody and uh, so if the signal is low it actually directly going to affect the sensitivity of the assay as well. Then you have the indirect ELISA. So, in the indirect ELISA what you are doing to do is you are actually uh, coating the uh, uh, surface with the anti uh, antigen then you are putting the primary antibody, uh, primary antibody to detect the antigen and then you are adding the secondary antibody to detect the primary antibody and then the secondary antibody is having the enzyme and then you are actually adding the substrate and that substrate is getting converted into a product and that product is giving you either the color or the, uh, the readable readouts and that actually can be done. So, in the secondary, so this, this kind of uh, indirect ELISA is being used either to measure the level of antigen as well as to me measure the level of antibodies. So, this setup is used to measure the level of antibodies in the serum and used to calculate the titer of the antibodies. In the indirect ELISA setup, a known amount of antigen is coated onto the well and it is incubated with the different dilutions of the antibodies. The antigen bound antibody is then recognized by a secondary antibody linked to the enzyme. A colorimetric substrate is used to measure the level of antibodies. So, let us see how to perform the indirect ELISA and what are the materials you are required. So, the materials what you require is the bicarbonate buffer which you require for coating, then you require the ELISA plate that is what you require for coating the antigen, then you require the antigen solutions and so you prepare the antigen solution of 5 microgram per ml in the bicarbonate buffer pH 9.2. Then you require the BSA which is actually going to be for a blocking and then you require the primary antibody and the secondary antibody and then you require the PBS which contains the 2 in 20. So, in a, in a procedure what you are going to do first you are going to do the coating of the antigen onto the plate, the ELISA plates, then you are going to incubate that with the primary antibody, then you are going to remove, you are going to do a washing step to remove the unbound antibodies, then you are going to add the secondary antibodies, then you are going to do a washing to remove the excess antibodies and then you are going to add the substrate and that actually is going to give you the colors. Let us see how to perform these steps. So, in the step 1 you are going to do a coating of antigen. So, you prepare the 5 microgram per ml of antigen solutions in a bicarbonate buffer, dispense the 50 microliter per well of the microliter plate, put it for overnight inside the fridge and that is sufficient for the antigen to coat to the, uh, to the microliter plate. Then you are going to do a blocking step. So, in the step 2 you block each well with the 1 percent BSA in a bicarbonate buffer for overnight. This blocking step is required because when you are coating the antigen, you are actually coating the antigen in a well. So, you are going to have the different, uh, different antigen molecules, but in between the antigen molecule this uh, this space is empty which it means like the plastic is empty and this plastic can easily provide the attachment site for the primary antibodies. So, before you add the primary antibody you have to fill this whole cavity or fill with this whole uh, well with a proteinaceous solution so that you actually going to cover the whole surface. So, the blocking is not going to block the epitopic sites onto the antigen, but it actually going to block all the remaining surfaces what is available in the well. Now, once, once your blocking is over then you can prepare the primary uh, antibodies dilutions. So, you can make a dilution of 1 is to 100, 1 is to 1000, 1 is to 1000, 2000 like that. So, what you have to do is you have to take the 2 microliter of original serum and then you mix it with the 198 microliter of PBS and that actually is going to give you a 200 microliter 1 is to 1000 diluted uh, sample. Then what you have to do is you have to take this one 
and 20 microliter of this and then you mix it with 180 that actually is going to give you 1 is 2000 then similarly you have to do a serial dilution like that and that actually is going to give you a serial diluted uh, antibody stock and that actually can be used uh, in a subsequent step for the incubations. Then you dispense the 50 microliter of each diluted antibody stock into respective well and then incubate it for 45 minutes for 37 degrees Celsius. Then in the step 4 you are going to do a washing. So in the washing 4 to time with the PBS containing 220 and then step 5 you have to add the secondary antibodies. So, so you have to add the appropriate concentration of the secondary antibody and then you dispense the 50 microliter per well and incubate in 40, 37 degrees Celsius for another 45 minutes. In the step 6 again you have to wash so that the excess uh, secondary antibodies can be removed and then. Uh, in the step 7 you are going to do a deployment. So, dispense 1 mg per ml OPD plus H2O2 in the citrate buffer. Uh, stop the reaction by 7.5 percent uh, sulfuric acid and take the absorbent at 460 nanometer. So, let us see how the results comes. The results will give you like this where this is the highest antibody concentration and this is the lowest antibody concentration. So, what you see is a orange color reaction which is a color what you get when you do use the OPD and uh, what you and if you plot these absorbance uh, uh, against the concentration of the antibody what you see is that it is actually going to give you a sigmoidal curve and with you using this sigmoidal curve you can be able to uh, determine the titer of the antibodies. So, this is all about the theoretical steps what we have. Uh, discussed about the indirect ELISA. Now, to show you all this step I can I will I will take you to my lab to show you a small demo and with this demo we are going to show you each and every step and then ultimately the students are going to show you the uh, the uh, the development of ELISA as well as that will actually is going to be helpful for you to understand the whole process. In this video we will demonstrate how to use a pathogenic infection detection kit and what is the underlying principle of that kit. So, mostly the detection kits works on uh, immunoassay. So, what is an immunoassay? In immunoassay, we will use specific antibodies like monoclonal antibodies against a disease specific or pathogen specific antibodies, uh, antigen then we will develop with the substrate. So, this will give some uh, positive uh, positive color and that will be detected by uh, spectrophotometer reading. So, the steps include, first step is we have to coat uh, the plate, polyvinyl chloride plate with the uh, capture antibody following uh, capturing of the uh, actual antigen, disease specific antigen. For suppose in most of the cases, suppose in viral infection, it will detect the coat protein and uh, in bacterial infection, the external polysaccharide, this kind of uh, antigens it will detect. Once the an antibody is coated on the plate, then we will incubate with the uh, sample taken from patient, either it is uh, saliva or serum sample. After incubation, we will wash properly, then again incubate with the uh, primary antibody specific to that particular antigen. It is, it mostly, uh, it should be monoclonal antibody, otherwise uh, the detection is non-specific. In next step, after washing the unbound primary antibody, we will incubate with the secondary antibody uh, that is septravidin conjugated to HRP. So, once the secondary antibody incubation is over, we will wash and add substrate solution. Uh, mostly, uh, it is uh, TMB or variants of TMB also available for enhanced uh, uh, chromophoric detection. Then we will read, uh, read the uh, color development using spectrophotometer. These are the main steps. So, in step by step, now we will demonstrate how to perform uh, the immunoassay. 
in order to perform a immuno assay we need the following materials first we need polyvinyl chloride uh, may plate 96 will plate which should be flat bottom then the other materials we need is coating buffer which is uh, bicarbonate buffer system with ph 9.6 so once it is ready you adjusted ph then we will dilute the uh, capture antibody in the coating buffer then uh, add 100 microliter dispense 100 microliter each into these wells so once the dispense uh, dispense is over then we will incubate this plate at 4 degrees celsius uh, preferably but we can incubate at room temperature also uh, for 2 hours if you are incubating at 4 degrees celsius you have to keep it overnight uh, otherwise uh, 2 hours is enough so now uh, we have coating buffer so I have dispensed it into reservoir then I will take the I will take the uh, capture antibody we have to see the dilution we have to follow manufacturer instructions for dilution otherwise improper dilution may give false positive results also or uh, no result also so once it is over then we have to dispense 100 microliter into each plate after proper mixing once the once the material is dispensed into plate we have to cover the uh, this plate with the paraffin or uh, covering plate then we will incubate this plate at, for 2 hours at room temperature post incubation we have to remove the uh, unbound solution so we will remove that We will wash the plate with TBST buffer, which should be pH 7.4. We have to wash at least three times properly, then we will we are going to black with the blacking buffer, which contains 3% BSA in uh, TBS. In next step we will dispense blocking buffer into each well 100 microliter each so it will cover the non specific uh, non specific area where there is no capture antibody so that the reaction will be uh, reaction is specific to particular antigen The blocking should be done at least for 2 hours at room temperature or overnight at 4 degrees Celsius. So here we, we have done at room temperature. Once the blocking is over, we have to remove remaining blocking buffer and wash 3 times and incubate with the primary antibody. So I am going to do that. In this step, we have to dilute the primary antibody with the assay diluent or in blocking buffer. Then mix properly and dispense 100 microliter 
each into 96 will be it. and incubate at room temperature for 2 hours once the primary antibody incubation is over we have to remove unbound antibody and wash with the TBST for at least 3 times so it will remove uh, unbound primary antibody and uh, in following step we will incubate with the uh, HRP conjugated secondary antibody and incubating it for 2 hours after incubation with secondary antibody we have to remove secondary antibody and wash thoroughly so after washing we will incubate with the substrate solution which is usually TMP tetramethyl benzene. So we will dispense the uh, substrate solution into wells. So once the dispensing is over we have to keep at room temperature for some time until the we can see a visible blue color once the reaction is over then we have to stop the reaction with the uh, two normal HCl or sulfuric acid after 15 minutes if you observe the plate we can see uh, the blue color intensity in some of the plates is very high and in some of the wells is very less so that means whatever the wells it is giving uh, intense blue color that means the concentration of the antigen is very high so at this moment we have to stop the reaction otherwise all the wells may turn into uh, blue color so we cannot identify uh, positive sample versus uh, false positive sample so there may be some uh, artifacts so that's why we have to stop the reaction uh, using a 2 normal HCl or H2SO4. We will add uh, uh, 2 normal H2SO4 to stop this reaction. So, as we can see, that blue color turned into yellow color. So we have to read this in uh, spectrophotometer at 540 nanometer and 450 nanometer to get uh, absolute values of these things. So this is qualitative purpose as well as quantitative purpose. Qualitative purpose in the sense if you are using uh, uh, samples from patients, you have to do it in triplicate and uh, you can just identify whether it, uh, that particular person is disease positive or negative. In another case, for quantitative purpose, you need to have various varying concentration titrations of uh, the particular antigen uh, which that disease uh, causes. So in this case, you have to dilute the antigen in different concentration and you have to uh, develop the assay in the same way developed here so you have to compare you have to plot a standard uh, graph uh, against the concentration versus the observance uh, we have taken from that value you will come to know what is the unknown persons uh, that uh, antigen titrations in his serum or saliva so that's why it is qualitative as well as quantitative method with this we can understand this method can also be applied for detection of various uh, chemicals various drugs in blood like uh, uh, drugs used for hallucination purposes and uh, recreational drugs and also some of the
drugs used in the uh, pharmaceuticals. With this, uh, I would like to conclude my lecture here and in the, in the demo video, the student might have discussed in detail about the different uh, steps related to ELISA and I hope this would be helpful for you to perform the essay in your lab. So, uh, with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you.